What's cracking? Big dogs. Sad day. Sad day in the headquarters. It's a day that I finally admit that there will be Sundays this upcoming season, September and October, and November and December, until we're gonna fucking six Super Bowl run and we trade bike for Julio. Then maybe January we won't have games without Julio. But one of my key terminologies in fantasy football, especially during these times of the year, these off season months is where there's smoke, there's fire. And the Julio rumors are looking like Snoop Dogg's chimney. It's sad. Doesn't look like he's going to be a Falcon in the 2021 season. And the reason we know that, one, is because Julio got fucking played. All right? Shannon Sharp, not cool, man. That was like some shit when your girlfriend calls your best friend and she's like, where is he? And you forgot to give your best friend the heads up. And then your best friend's like, what you mean? I thought he was with you. He told me it was date night. Then y'all start doing the mathematics in your head. And if so facto, y'all fucked up. That's what Julio, Julio got played live on air. Regardless, he knew it was coming. Julio asked for a trade supposedly months before the NFL draft actually happened. He's 32 years old. He's not washed by any by any stretch of the imagination. Maybe he's not the same old Julio Jones that he was five, eight years ago, but he's still pretty damn fucking good. He would still be the wide receiver one on 95% of NFL teams right now. This is something we talked about in last week's Must Own Wide Receivers video. If you missed that, I will link that down below in the description. Julio Jones is 16 game pace from 2020. You discount the games that he left with injury. So he played in nine games. Two of them he left after like 20% of the snaps because of the injury. It it rung up on him a little bit. So he had to leave the game. In those seven games, his his pace, his 16 game pace, 103 catches, 1600 yards, seven touchdowns. Some team, some team is getting the jewel of the offseason. Some team is going to get what I had for so many years. It's you know, it's when that fucking ex-girlfriend leaves and then she starts popping up on Instagram with the new guy and you're like oh that motherfucker like that used to be mine that coke bottle latina i'm sorry i got like way too into that and like it made it seem like that was a really personal issue to me i just yeah, i got into acting mode i got into my my methodology acting it's what i do when i get into these scenes that doesn't happen to me i'm not a jealous motherfucker so julio jones gonna be somewhere else and i'm gonna be very upset about it on sundays so we want to start looking at where he could possibly end up being traded to and i want to rank some of the landing spots in terms of fantasy football for dynasty for redraft what happens to those teams what happens to the atlanta falcons right so you look at the actual makeup of his contract right now the window for the trade won't happen until after june 1st so right now it is may 25th you're watching this on may 26th so we got like five or six days before the trade can actually happen they might agree to terms prior to it so the falcons can defer a 15 million dollar dead cap to next year which is what they need. They literally need it. They physically need it in order to be able to play in the National Football League next year. So the trade's going to happen after June 1st. This is per over the cap. I don't know if that's a blog. I don't know what the fuck that is. But if he were to be traded, the team acquiring him would have to have at least $15.3 million available in cap space to take on his current contract, which runs through 2023. As it stands, 11 teams, Jacksonville, the Jets, Cincinnati, Denver, Cleveland, Washington, Indy, the Chargers, Detroit, San Francisco, and New England currently have $15.9 million or more in cap space. Again, that's per over the cap. Here's the thing about that. Like, that's just which teams have that right now. A bunch of teams, if they were to trade for Julio, one would be able to make room if they wanted to. They can cut other players on their roster. So just because you got Julio and you had maybe $13 million of cap space and you got Julio, you could you could cut somebody else. You could trade another player to the Falcons in the trade. And if it's not dead cap space for the Falcons, they could take them on and then cut them and release them, whatever the case may be. Those are not the only teams in contention for it. We want to see who Vegas thinks are the odds on favorite in order for Julio to be taking the first snap for. And these have been changing on the daily. So these are per DraftKings Sportsbook as of yesterday or as of two days ago when you're when you're watching this video so these have these maybe have already drastically changed by the time you're watching this so just keep an eye on google just go, you know julio jones odd shit you can find that on google patriots are the favorite right now plus 400 the falcons still plus 500 warms my heart a little bit the raiders uh tied with the falcons at plus 500 you have the chargers the ravens the colts the jaguars the 49ers the titans the browns the cowboys whatever on and on and on and on there aren't a lot of landing spots where I see Julio Jones' value goes up after leaving the Falcons, right? You qu you quickly go down that favorite list. You have the New England Patriots. They're a team that's obviously very run heavy. They ranked 31st last year in terms of passing rate. So they were the second highest run heavy team in the NFL. They obviously have Cam. We have no idea what Cam actually has in his arm. He didn't get to use it last year because he didn't have weapons, but there's a chicken or the egg situation to be had here. Next on the list is the Las Vegas Raiders. I actually think this is an interesting landing spot and definitely, definitely within the range of outcomes of something that, you know, might be realistic for Julio landing in. In Las Vegas we've seen John Gruden churn out some big fantasy wide receiver one seasons before as a head coach I could see Julio seeing you know 130 plus targets if he were to land in Las Vegas so this is one of the few spots where I actually think his value goes up but my favorite spot the number one ranked spot where 
I think Julio Jones holds the most, the single most value going anywhere would be the Los Angeles Chargers, okay? On the surface, it might seem like it's a little bit messy, but I really don't think it is. You have Keenan Allen, and then you have Austin Eckler out of the backfield, and that's really it, man. Hunter Henry is gone. Mike Williams has one year left on his contract, but he's proven that he's basically a complimentary outside receiver at this point. Uh, and that's when he could stay on the damn field. Every time he goes up for a jump ball, he gets choke slammed, breaks his fucking back. Doctor said he needs a backyotomy, and then Julio takes over as the alpha there. But regardless, this is one of the few places where I see he could land and hold dynasty value because of Justin Herbert, of course, right? You look at the Chargers' new offensive coordinator, Joe Lombardi. He said an up-tempo offense will be a part of what we're building here. They want to play into Justin Herbert's strengths. Lombardi mentions how Herbert is comfortable with, with playing fast based on his time at Oregon, and Staley has already talked to Lombardi about utilizing a no-huddle offense at times. The new Chargers coach, Brandon Staley, we want to uniquely shape our offense around Justin Herbert. This is good. Pace. We want pace. We want pace. We want pace. We want targets for Julio Jones. We want somewhere he can go that will have the requisite volume. A lot of places he might end up, a team might trade for him, and it, it might be a better football move than an actual fantasy football move. But the Chargers are a team with Mike Williams' contract being up and no other real wide receiver threats to the target volume. He could land and still maintain dynasty value through a couple of years. His contract is through the end of next year. You have the Ravens next up on the list, and they're the run heaviest team in the NFL. Obviously, no one wants them to go there. The Colts are actually another interesting landing spot for Julio Jones and a realistic landing spot, in my opinion. If he goes there, he actually has a shot of being the alpha immediately and getting 130 plus targets. You have T.Y. Hilton way past his prime. You have Michael Pittman there, who, you know, hasn't proven anything at all in the NFL. He had every chance and every opportunity opportunity to be the alpha down the stretch last year while Hilton was hurt and then you have you know Paris Campbell who's missed the majority of his first two seasons as an NFL wide receiver and looking at the data looking bike at the data that almost never ever ever ends well for wide receivers when you miss the majority of your beginning of your career right the first year the second year very 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 few wide receivers go on to have success so th this is a completely wide open depth chart you have Wentz coming in there who you know if he can recapture some of his form throwing the ball to Julio 120 130 times in the year could happen. Uh, you look at the Jaguars as well. Can definitely take them on given the cap space that they have. I don't like the landing spot. He'd be the alpha, but there's still too many wide receivers there between Shark and LaVisca, and they bring on Travis Etienne. You know, I, I, I wouldn't expect more than like 110, 115 targets in the first year with Trevor Lawrence there. So I don't love the landing spot. It would be nice for Trevor Lawrence, obviously, but not for fantasy football. Then you got the 49ers. I would kind of hate this, right? Trey Lance, if he ends up under center, he's going to be a, a leading a very run heavy offense. They already have George Kittle. They have Debo Samuel. They have Brandon Ayuk. This would hurt Brandon Ayuk the most in my opinion because he is the outside guy there Debo plays line of scrimmage George kills across the middle and over the seam and again it's just going to be a run heavy offense it's the way the scheme is Jimmy Garoppolo is not good enough downfield to connect with Julio enough to give him fantasy value so I don't like that spot either so again my favorite landing spots would be the Chargers then the Raiders and then the Colts and one of the big questions obviously is what happens in Atlanta when Julio is gone it's gonna be a tough ride for Atlanta but it will be easy to predict because everything will start to go through Calvin Ridley and Kyle Pitts this is per Graham Barfield over at Fantasy Points in the seven games that Julio Jones has missed over the last two years. Calvin Ridley has gone 8 for 91, 5 for 110, 8 for 136, 6 for 50 in a touchdown, 8 for 124 in a touchdown, 10 for 163 in a touchdown, and 5 for 130. If you take away the week 8 game in which he left early because of injury, Ridley finished as a wide receiver 2 or better in 10 of 14 games. That is remarkable consistency. So he automatically becomes a top 5 fantasy wide receiver for 2021 if Julio is gone. He is currently the wide receiver 8 off the board per underdog ADP. I will link the underdog fantasy ADP down below. If you want to come draft with us, use promo code BDGE. They're going to throw $25 on your account when you deposit $10 or more. 25th pick overall. And I've actually seen that uh, start to creep up a little bit with the Julio hype. So that, that ADP of wide receiver 825 is with the Julio hype moving him up. So a couple of weeks ago, he was going in the late third, early fourth round. So if you got Calvin Ridley there, fantastic. Once Julio is gone, Calvin Ridley is going to end up being a back end second round pick, if not a middle second round pick. So go get all the Calvin you can while you can. Matt Ryan will obviously suffer. You look at the splits that he's had with and without Julio Jones, everything goes down. Yards per game, yards per attempt, touchdowns per game. It's going to be bad. Matt Ryan kind of falls down to that middle QB2 range. Obviously, he's still startable in super flex leagues, but this was probably going to be a little bit more run heavy of an offense, and he's not going to take as many shots downfield with a guy like Julio not on the field. And Kyle Pitts, lastly, will skyrocket up. He's currently going off the board as the tight end four in underdog drafts overall 60. I think people will uh, immediately start to put him into that Darren Waller, George Kittle range. Obviously not up to the Kelsey, you know, aspect of fantasy football, but right there into like the, the late third-ish round where you're starting to see tight ends go off the board. I know Kittle and Waller are like in the 24-25 range where that's like a 212-301, but Kyle Pitts will start to go in the third round. People will not be able to suffice their appetites when Julio is off thy field. That's all I got for you. Will I be drafting Pitts at that spot? 
No, I will not. Okay. That is just too much for me. I'm not looking to grab a rookie in the third round, a rookie tight end in the third round. That is just out of control. Okay. So that's what I got for the Julio breakdown. Once he actually gets moved, once he actually gets moved, we will do another video, another featured film breaking down, obviously where he goes, what that means for the fantasy impact of the team he lands on. I'm out. I love y'all. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new and we'll see you tomorrow. I got to get on a call. That's why I rush this. I'm really sorry. Bye.